I want to thank you for inviting us into your space. Uh, already learning uh, from you. Thanks. Another shout out for Garcia. That was amazing. Um, and um, a shout out, like it's an amazing crowd to look into. A special shout out to all the queer and non-binary and trans folks out there. Uh, it's nice. It's nice to see some friendly faces. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the conversation, a lot of our lives is around what we are handing you. And we're handing you a lot. And most of it, much of it, a lot of it is not good. Um, and I think the best thing we can do is try and help as we're handing off this world go, um, here, here's this we messed up. Yeah, th this isn't working so good. Um, what inspires me is all of you. Um, I'm amazed by the next generation. And you know, I see it as just my challenge to try and unscrew it up a little bit more before you all fix it. And it's, it's not right. We shouldn't be handing you what we're handing you, but we have. Um, and I think the other thing we can do is, is help educate you. And I'm excited because I think the two people uh, to my right uh, really have thought a lot about th the technologies that we're handing off and how to um, better use them, better hold them, uh, make them your own, take what you want, reject, feel confident in rejecting the pieces that don't work for you. And uh, I couldn't possibly say it better than Garcia or either of these folks. So let me introduce them. Uh, Ashbot uh, is uh, kind of the bridge. He's actually closer to your generation than mine, um, uh, but has already taken on kind of the, the world of fake news and technology that we've handed him and said, I'm going to fix it. So he's already helping the cause. And Tristan Harris is one of the leading voices out there, helped build some of this technology, uh, was at some of the companies building it, and is now saying, wait a second, what, what's, what's up with what we've built? And what is it doing? And is it serving us, or are we serving it? So um, I introduced you guys super briefly, um, but maybe kind of tell everyone kind of where you come at this, and when you first felt like there needed to be a morality around technology. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> In my case, I was a. This all started for me when I was a uh, student at Berkeley. And a massive protest happened at our university where Milo Yiannopoulos came to our campus and spoke. And for me, I, I just saw this massive disconnect between what was happening online and what was happening <clears throat> at, at the university. We, we had students cleaning up our campus while people online were accusing us of being paid protesters. And that sort of got, that, that, was, that was what got me to start uh, looking at this issue of fake news and saying, hey, like, this is a problem of our generation and someone needs to step up and do something about it. And that's when my co-founder and I decided to uh, start researching the problem and uh, tr try to make a difference. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm honored to be here with you guys. I, I really think that we, I, we have to invest all our future in you. So uh, I really hope that we can empower you to do the most that you can possibly do. Um, my background is I was a design ethicist at Google, which meant I was studying how do you ethically manipulate two billion people's thoughts. If you think about um, basically, how many of you use Snapchat as your primary communication tool? Some? OK. Wait, is there something else? Instagram? Am I missing one? Is there another one? Discord, texting. Discord, texting. OK. Twitter, OK. So Twitter, Discord, Snapchat, Instagram. Tumblr. So what do these things, Tumblr, what do these things have in common? Um, they're built by people. And they design them to work in a certain way. And um, I was someone who was inside the tech industry for a long time. I had a whole career in the tech industry. I built a tech company. And Google um, acquired our team. We landed at Google. And I basically felt like something was going wrong with how we were building technology because it was more about addicting people and keeping them hooked on the screen than it was about actually helping people or making positive differences in their lives. Because behind Instagram, Snapchat, um, you know, YouTube, uh, Facebook, are a 1,000 engineers who go to work every day, not because they're evil or they're bad, but their business model is to capture attention. Like how much have you paid for your Instagram account recently or for your Snapchat account? Zero because they sell attention, which they get from people, to someone else. And that's how they make all their money, which means that they have to have a 1,000 engineers that go to work every day that figure out how to play magic tricks on the human mind. When I was a kid, I was a magician. And so it taught you that basically human minds can be manipulated. And so for example, like, how do you know when to finish um, you know, drinking that, that bottle of Coke? Like, There's a bottom to the, to the bottle of Coke. And so 
you know that you're done. If you're a technology maker, like you make Instagram, you want to rip out the bottom and make it so it just keeps refilling with more stuff, like more Coke, so that you don't even think about whether you want to stop. And so there's all these sort of design techniques that are used to manipulate and, and kind of engage people. And when I was at Google, I said, you know, this isn't OK. Uh, this is harming society. Um, and we have a responsibility to do it. And so I'm, I'm eager to talk more about that later, but just wanted to introduce my background. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Well, let's start with the concept of fake news. Um, you know, we did, um, Axios is a fairly new news site. We're like a year and a half old. Um, we had a survey with SurveyMonkey out today that like 90% of Republicans think that the, um, that the media that they read is intentionally misleading and wrong. And the numbers aren't that much lower for independents and Democrats. Um, we live in a society where it is literally the case that we live in two different worlds. People are more segregated physically than ever. They're more segregated digitally. And we don't even agree on the facts. Um, how big a problem is that? And what are some of the solutions? Yeah, uh, like to, to go to the point that you just brought up, one of the things that's incredibly scary to us is how the truth has uh, become very subjective in the sense that depending on who you are and uh, uh, the context that you have, you, you tend to look at stories in a certain way. Um, in terms of approaching solutions, uh, we've, the way we've approached misinformation being spread on Twitter is looking for automated behavior and looking at uh, amplified voices and sort of calling those out. Not necessarily saying, hey, this is fake news, but rather this is misleading and is being amplified. And how do you find that? What are you spotting? And what do you, when you spot something, what do you do? Yeah, so we, our, our philosophy is that we want to empower, uh, empower people online uh, and protect them from being misled by misinformation. And so this, in our, one of our first products was a product called BotCheck. And uh, this is a product that essentially anyone could install. And it provided a uh, button very similar to the retweet button called BotCheck on Twitter. And essentially, you could look at any tweet. And if uh, you were worried about uh, seeing a voice that was amplified and uh, was misleading, you could click a button. And at, at the click of a button, we would tell you that, hey, this is a bot or this is a human. And Tristan, was there a moment for you that you said, what we're building isn't serving us? And how early did that come? And how, how much do you sense that others have hit that moment versus that moment has yet to hit? Um, yeah. Um, well, it's, it's interesting when you're inside of a system where you have thousands of people who go to work around you doing a particular thing. And then one day you wake up and you kind of look around and you give things a weird look and you say, is this right? Everyone else is doing it. Um, everyone else seems to think it's OK. Um, and yet I sort of felt basically back in 2012 or 13 that there was a problem. And I felt really insecure about it because I thought if there was a problem, surely one of these other thousands of smart Google, I mean, Google's filled with smart people, right? There's like PhDs and super smart people work there. Surely someone would have spotted this if there was a problem. And what I found out was, and also I thought, you know, if they had spotted the problem, surely someone else, it was their job to work on it, right? And then I basically realized, I, I made this presentation. I was feeling really insecure and kind of afraid. And I made a presentation saying, hey, I think that technology that we're building is creating a public health crisis around loneliness and addiction. And it's shaping the next generation um, because people check their phones 150 times a day. Um, there's about 2.2 billion people who use Facebook, by the way. That's about the number of followers of Christianity. 1.9 billion people use YouTube. That's about the number of followers of Islam. So if you just think of the surface area, from the moment you wake up and do this, you know, you undo your alarm, you're like jacked in because thoughts start streaming into your head that you didn't even choose. And um, so when you just recognize how much influence that is, I thought that it was someone else's job at Google to ask that question. And I made this presentation saying, hey, maybe there's a problem here and we should uh, solve it. I sent it to 10 people for feedback, this like, little presentation. It was a slide deck. And um, I found out that it spread virally to 5,000 people, 10,000 people at Google the next day. Um, and so it spread throughout the whole company. And I felt like, oh my god, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> and I thought that this was like, going to be the end of, of everything. But actually, people's response was really positive, because they agreed that there was a problem. And it was really weird that you could be in a situation where everyone would kind of agree that there was a problem, even though no one had been doing anything about it. 
And so the me that's the message that I have for you is sometimes there's a really important job to be done. And you might think, oh, that's someone else is going to solve that problem. But what if you're the one that needs to solve that problem? Because I didn't know that that was the case for, for me. So I want to get a sense of how you guys view it as a problem or not. Um, but before that, uh, I want to just put out, I, it, I'm acknowledging it's a problem for me. I have three phones because I'm always writing about it. I spend my entire life on my phone. Uh, so I'm guilty. So before I ask all of you, but I'm curious how many of you, you guys are all on social media, right? Is there anyone that's not, doesn't use their smartphone? One? OK. Um, how many in the room think they spend too much time on their phone? OK. Um, how many people like what they do on their phone? How many people feel better after they're using their phone? OK. Um, so I, I could ask these questions for a long time, but I think that helps get a sense. I mean, I, I feel very similarly. I use my phone all the time. I like using my phone. It doesn't actually necessarily bring me happiness. So I'm, I'm in the same boat. Everyone here is in the same boat. What do each of you recommend? Like, what are, what are some ways we can start to question our use, change it? I don't think, who actually wants to give up their phone? A couple. Wow. Um, but most, most of us don't. But how many of us would like to use it better and have, feel like we were more in control? OK. Mm -hmm. Uh, luckily, we've got some really good people up here. Uh, Tristan, this is, he runs a thing called the Center for Humane Technology that's all about that. You guys aren't about confiscating phones and bashing them. You're about. Yeah, the, it, the point isn't that we want to get rid of technology or go back in time. It's just we need to design it to be humane. You know, it's like you can humanely treat an animal, which is you treat it with respect and dignity, and you care for it, and you are compassionate. Or you can not treat it humanely. You can treat it inhumanely not treat it like it's human or, or uh, with con, um, dignity, respect, compassion. So um, I mean, you know, there's sort of the tips and tricks how to use your phone better version of this conversation, which is you can turn off notifications and set your phone to grayscale. Um, did you know that, by the way? You can actually set your phone to grayscale, which means that when you look at your phone, you don't see colors anymore. And when, when you do that, um, it's like it's subtracting the, the, it's like if you're a chimpanzee, then you look at your phone and it's a banana, you're like subtracting the bananas out of the, the phone. It like makes it a little bit less appealing. And these are some small things you can do if your phone's buzzing against your leg a little bit less often by turning off notifications, that can help. But the thing that, that we've been advocating for is not how to better use existing technology. We were actually willing to say, do we have to change the whole thing? And that's, that's our mission, is to change the whole thing. And we're starting to see some progress. Google and Apple have both come out with tools that um, you know, are great for, are better at helping parents manage their kids' usage. But the piece that gets the least attention is the fact they're actually designed to help the adults better use their own technology. Yeah, yeah. And so just to give you some background on that, when I was inside of Google, I was trying to help um, them change their products, change Android, which is like half of mobile phones. Um, to respect people's attention so that people didn't get as many notifications, so that you didn't get as, much, as addicted, and show people how much time they spent, things like that. And I worked for two years within Google to try and get them to do those things, and they didn't do it. Um, and they didn't do it not because they, weren't, they were evil or they like, wanted to profit hungry or something like that. There just wasn't enough public pressure. And so I actually left to try and create kind of a public conversation about it and after three years of that, I was on the television show 60 Minutes about a year ago, if you guys have seen 60 Minutes. And um, you know, one year later, Google and Apple are both launching a whole bunch of features that are around helping people manage their screen time better. And so it's pretty remarkable that if you're using these systems and you feel, man, I'm addicted, and you feel like maybe it's just about changing it how I use it, but what if we could change it for everybody? You know? So I want to get to all of your questions, because what you have to ask is really what's most important. But I wanted to ask you, you guys have been looking at you know, a narrower set of problems, Twitter and bots. How much do you think this problem is going to get worse? Just to throw out a few things that are coming our way. Um, we already have pretty good Photoshops. It's hard to tell a fake photo. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to make any person a video that realistically looks. I can have Tristan saying, we need to use our smartphones more. Uh, I can have you saying, I am not a bot. All this stuff, how much work, and, and computers that sound like humans. Uh, you know, Alexa today 
sounds a little bit human, but doesn't really feel like a human. Google has a technology that sounds like a human. How, how much bigger is this problem going to get? Yeah, yeah. In terms of, uh, you, you were just mentioning a, a technology called deep fakes, where essentially uh, there are videos where you can essentially put on any face onto a, uh, onto a video that already exists. And this is incredibly scary because there are already people today that call real news fake. And the moment that we get to a position where we can't tell the difference between, in, between real and fake, we're at a point of no return. And uh, that's, that's something that is incredibly scary to us. And the way we're sort of approaching this is we're actually building technology right now around uh, combating that and empowering people with uh, the security tools so that in the case that they come across a doctored image or a doctored video, they have the security to be able to tell uh, that they are looking at something that is doctored. And that's super important, one, because you can have real news that appears as fake. But as soon as everyone realizes we have that technology, it makes it easier to call real news fake. Right. Um, so I want to open it up um, to all of you. And there's folks, I think, coming with microphones. So if you can raise your hand and say uh, who you are and uh, ask whatever you want to ask. I see one over there. Sorry. Um. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm August Pomerenke. Uh I'm here with uh, some of my friends from our uh, organization down in Grand Junction, Colorado, Grand Valley Students United, and we're uh, focused on a lot of different things. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, how do I check my own feed for its credibility, and how do I determine whether or not the news that I'm being given is uh, true or not? Great question. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh Within Robot Labs, we're actually working on a couple initiatives around uh, fake news itself. Uh, in terms of a couple insights that we've come to recently, we found that uh, images are actually some of the best indicators of whether content is misleading or not. Um, you can actually look at the context of the image and uh, use that to essentially understand whether the content itself is misleading or not. So uh, with this insight, we're actually building a tool right now called SurfSafe, which we plan to uh, announce uh, next month around uh, exactly that issue. When you're browsing Facebook, when you're browsing Twitter, when you're on any site, uh, we'll be able to tell the, um, how misleading content is based on the images that are actually in, uh, in that news story. Cool. Other questions? Over here. Hi. Uh, my name's Chriselle, and I have a question about uh, technology and how it relates to adults who are older than us. So I find a lot of the time the conversation around this is about young people as if we are somehow more susceptible to misinformation. When actually I found that older adults, my grandmother, a, a lot of great aunts, whatnot, they're the ones who share posts that are very obviously false and who believe them. And how are we addressing those issues in that group that's somewhat less aware? I mean, I think it's a great question. And, and I, my observation is I would agree. I think your generation has grown up with this technology um, and already kind of knows its limits better than the generation that created it, and definitely uh, better than the generation that's trying to adapt to it. Um, I mean, I send my parents to Snopes when they send me the mm -hmm. scams and stuff. But what do you have? Do you guys have other tips for? Um, and maybe you know, I think some of it is shifting the conversation back and not being afraid to say we're not actually the ones with the problem. You guys are. Yeah, I think a question that we all need to be asking is how do we know what we know? Most of what we know, we think we know it because other people told us that. And um, if you actually ask the question, like, how do I know that for sure, there's a whole field of philosophy that's just about that. But I think that, to your point, I do think that um, older generations are very vulnerable. There's a Stanford study showing that, like, I think Stanford undergraduates, sorry, not, I know you went to Berkeley, but uh, Stanford <laughs> undergraduates um, uh, like have very high rates of falling in for fake news. Um, and adults are very susceptible. I think the younger people are better, in some ways, at spotting these things, because you've grown up with the internet, so you can be more discerning. But I think you should really question, what am I reading online, and, and how do I know that this is a trustworthy source? And it's really important in calling out. Like, you guys have powerful voices on social media. When someone that's in your circle is posting something not true, whether it's your friend, your parent, your grandparent, I think it's really important to call it out. Um, anyway. I think uh, another thing that uh, we, we've seen at Robot Labs, and like one thing that we find your group uh, doing incredibly well is like putting pressure on these organizations. Yeah. Um, one thing that we've done is like in a lot of our interviews, we, we really put pressure on groups like Twitter, uh, where they should be taking a more active role. And as of yesterday, they've announced that they are taking an active role around uh, bots and misinformation. Mm -hmm. And so 
just from that perspective, like people like us that are not necessarily running these big, big companies have, have the ability to start these conversations that create change. Yeah. And, and if, if everyone demanded that Facebook and Twitter do better, they actually have the tools right. to do this. They choose, uh, Tristan was talking earlier today about how you know, their algorithm already chooses what to serve up to you. It could make reliability of the information a higher priority than virality. I think there's a temptation when you, when you think about technology companies and they're like these huge behemoth powerful corporations like $500 billion for Facebook and $900 billion for Apple. And you think like, how could you possibly go against something or change or put pressure on something that big? But behind companies are just people. I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of technology executives at Facebook, at Google, at Twitter, et cetera, they don't let their own kids use social media. Um, because they don't think it's very good. And so uh, I was invited, actually, by the headmasters of some schools, some, um, some special schools in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, where those kids go to school, where they're actually, they don't use technology. And I was invited because if I spoke to the, to the kids there, um, they thought they, they would raise the conversation with their parents, <laughs> and their parents worked at the companies, and so they say things like, why aren't we doing more with bots, Dad? And you know, the dad's got to sit there and say, yeah, they're feeling this pressure from their own children. So you have to recognize you can make a lot of change happen by understanding where power is. And especially that this power is just in people you know, who are persuadable. Awesome. I think we have another one over there. And then did you? OK, next up front after. Yeah, please. Oh, cool. Hello, my name is Chris Ryerson. I'm from the Aspen area. Um, my question, or yes, my question relates to some gaps in this conversation that I'm hearing so far in that we have talked about how Facebook can customize a feed for you and choose what you have. But for our generation, the generation below us and older people, we're all at risk from social media sites like YouTube uh, giving us recommended videos or having ads on our videos that push an agenda. Um, for example, I am personally interested in World War II history. And I also hate Nazis, but also, there have been several neo-fascist ads on my videos because I look at military history. There's been targeted ads from people who say, like, okay, a lot of my, a lot of my support base or people who I want to interact with come, uh, are interested in military history. Let's put those ads there. And then on my younger cousin's Minecraft videos, there were some ads that, uh, from a conservative firm talking about how socialism is pure evil. And I've seen it the other way around. What work are you guys doing towards putting pressure on YouTube or so Google to address this, these algorithms that are yeah. allowing people to focus in on target audiences, Great vulnerable question. audiences. It's a really, really, really good question. Um, I'm very worried about YouTube. If you care about the midterm elections, if you care about um, you know, basically what people are thinking and believing, you should care about YouTube. And per your point, you're exactly right. More than 70%, um, an estimation of, of an of a ex YouTube engineer who works with us, um, of YouTube's traffic comes from the up next feature, the, the, recommend, or the sidebar, the recommended videos. Meaning it's not people typing in, I want to see World War II video, it's the recommendation, and we're gonna autoplay this next. And it's been shown there's a systematic bias where if you airdrop a human being and they land on a regular 9-11 news video from the terrorist attack, uh, or any video, two videos later after autoplay, they're watching 9-11 conspiracy theory videos. If you, if you airdrop a human being, a, a teenage girl, into a video on dieting, two videos later there are anorexia videos. Now why is that happening? It's because they're trying to maximize how much attention they, they get from you, how long they get you to stay. So if they had a choice when you start in a dieting video to, um, to go the other way towards something that's calm, that's not gonna be as good as getting you you're just keeping you to stay on YouTube as driving you down the anorexia direction. So that's the problem is that these systems are trying to maximize attention and it's out of control because this is happening in languages that the engineers at YouTube don't even speak, right? In the Middle East or something like that. So we have to, we have to it's a big problem. So it's a great question and there's more to the answer, but yeah. um, I want to get to one more question. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the work you guys are doing and I think a lot of the youth appreciates it as well. I'm also from Grand Valley Students United. My name is Riley Trujillo. Uh, my question is that we often see that the contribution of fake news um, from political party increases polarization. Um, 
and mistrust between parties and in, in the political system in general. So how do we spread this knowledge and this awareness of the fake news that is being spread without um, promoting polarization or promoting a specific political agenda? And how do we just bring awareness about it? Great question, Ash. Yeah, yeah, on, on that point, one thing that we found incredibly, uh, uh, or one thing that we've been terrified by is uh, how we've been seeing actors actually try to polarize uh, users of so certain social media sites. For example, on Twitter after the Parkland shootings, we saw a hashtag gun control now uh, get, uh, get amplified. And that to us was incredibly, incredibly scary considering that other hashtags like hashtag mental, health, Ill, mental illness were not. And as a byproduct, uh, the conversations became a lot more polarized. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, your question around what we can do about, what we can do with political parties, um, I think the, the approach that uh, we're taking is, hey, we want to empower, empower users so that they have all the information so that they can come to these uh, uh, judgments in, in a very quick fashion. And that's, that's sort of what we, we've been optimizing around. But um, it, it is a very tough situation to be in. Uh, and um, in terms of that, like, I, I think there's a uh, component of public pressure that uh, we, need, we need to think through uh, when it comes to political parties. My quick answer, I know we're out of time, is um, People think that, oh, those people over there, they can be manipulated or fall for fake news. But us in this room, we're the smart ones, and it's just them over there, right? And I think um, if you're interested, I would really check out the 60 Minutes episode that we did on brain hacking, because it, it kind of exposes that everyone actually can be influenced in ways that they don't see. And I think that's an powerful message, because there's no one either on the left or on the right politically that doesn't want to feel like they make their own free choices. Like, no one wants to feel like they're manipulated. And if you follow, one last thing, tobacco, um, the way that we dealt with the cigarettes uh, problem was not by telling people this is bad for you. We actually, um, there was a 60 Minutes piece about how tobacco knew that they were manipulating with nicotine. They were purposefully making it addictive. And that's what caused people to say, wait a second, I'm free. I don't want to be manipulated by someone else. So I really think that that's, that's a, a powerful rhetorical frame that everybody on all sides would want to make a free choice. So this is hopefully just the start of a discussion that you all will continue. And I encourage you to demand the technology that you want out of the companies, out of the products you use. I want to thank my fellow panelists, Ash and Tristan. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation, I do a daily tech newsletter. You can just go to getlogin.axios.com, or I'm at Ina Fried on Twitter. All of our Twitter bios are, are handles are in the bio. Um, thank you so much for letting us have a little bit of your time.